I will invite uh, Dr. Abhijit Kunur to give his first talk on central venous catheterization. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Jigish. Uh, at the outset, let me thank uh, the Vatikuti Foundation and Dr. Vijigish Vas for having me and involving me in this uh, very uh, interesting topic. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, hemodialysis and hemodialysis catheters. Uh, the flow of the talk is going to be about uh, indications of hemodialysis and something about hemodialysis catheters, indications, complications, and management. So hemodialysis indications, the most common and prominent indications is to continue maintenance hemodialysis in patients who are already on dialysis. The other is urgent or emergent indications where they can be metabolic in nature, like electrolytes and acid-base imbalances, uh, increased extracellular fluid volume, also known as hypervolemia or congestive heart failure, signs of uremia, especially pericarditis, encephalopathy, or otherwise unexplained decline in mental status, poisonings, toxins, and some malignancies where hemodialysis is used to remove abnormal products or byproducts of therapy. And finally, but rarely, you could have uh, uh, hemodialysis to modulate body functioning, like patients who have suffered from hypothermia to warm their blood up, or osmotic challenges, especially after exposure to high uh, ionic contrasts, one would uh, require patients to be dialyzed. These are the most common uh, indications to uh, administer dialysis to anybody. I would focus everybody's attention on the ones where the black arrows are, and especially patients who are having severe acidosis with a pH of less than 7.15, or who have hyperkalemia with a serum potassium level of more than six milliequivalents per liter and ECG changes. That's very important. Also patients who have a blood urea nitrogen of more than 100, uh, severe hypermagnesemia of more than eight milliequivalents per liter, and uh, somebody who has diuretic resistant fluid overload requiring him uh, external ventilatory support. Vascular excess can be of three natures depending on the time. Uh, acute, which is less than 90 days, usually we use uh, venous catheters as a bridge that is uh, from 90 days to three years, one could use a tunnel cuff venous catheter or prosthetic AV grafts, or for somebody who requires uh, vascular access use for more than three years, uh, autogenous AV fistula is the best possible access. Hemodialysis catheters are of... Uh, the tunneled or the non-tunneled variety. A catheter can be broadly divided into three parts. One is the connectors and the hub part. The second is the body of the catheter. And finally, there is the catheter tip, which lies inside the vessel. So uh, depending on the material, length, lumen size, lumen configuration, inlet and outlet holes, and connector extensions, various type of catheters are available in the market. So um, in the catheter characteristics, characteristics catheters uh, material, uh, initially Teflon and polyvinyl was used, but they were found to be very thrombogenic. And hence now for temporary catheters, usually polyurethane is used, uh, although it is stiff and radio opaque, Tunnel catheters typically are made out of silicone or silicone elastomers. Uh, they are quite flexible. They have thick walls and the cuff used in the tunnel catheter is usually made of Dacre. There are newer catheters coming, which are made of carbothane material. Uh, the length and lumen size, very important for a nephrologist. The lumen sizes usually are from nine to 16 French and the internal diameter is usually anywhere from 0.75 to 2.2 millimeters. The catheter length varies according to its function and 
to the site where it is inserted. So a right internal jugular vein catheter will be around 15 centimeters in length. A left internal jugular vein catheter will be around 20 centimeters in length. A femoral catheter will be around 20 to 24 centimeters in length. And a tunnel catheter can, especially from the femoral, can be anywhere from 50 to 70 centimeters in length. The catheters uh, typically look like these. These are all the tunnel catheters. Uh, depending on the lumen, uh, one can have the arterial and venous lumens, which are completely separated. They could be partially separated or they could be conjoined. So in the tessio catheters, you have them completely separated, which you can see on the left upper portion. The uh, other could be uh, a variant of tessio where it is partially separated. The typical quintens of permacath is uh, the catheter where it's partially separated as two separate lumens jacketed by a common paleurethane. And last is the vascath, which is used commonly now. And there is a double D configuration for the vascath. Tips. The tip of the tunnel catheter can either be stepped or split or at the same level or self-centering. So depending on this, uh, various types of catheters are uh, manufactured. There are a variety, but let me tell you that studies or evidence at this point of time does not give any superiority or non-inferiority to any catheter based on the, uh, the, the uh, tip uh, configuration. Of very, the importance of the catheter is its use for dialysis. So the flow of blood through these catheters is extremely important. We all know flow is increased and is in direct proportion to a four uh, power diameter. Flow is inversely proportional to the length of the catheter. So larger catheters typically give better flow, but they are compromises on the ease of placement and the hydraulic conductance of tunnel catheters are comparable to a 16G AV fistula needle. Uh, blood flow achieved. So the non-tunnel catheters achieve a flow of around 250 ml per minute when the prescribed pump speed is around 300 ml per minute. And it's higher in the right IJV as compared to the left because it's, it has to travel shorter distances. Tunnel catheters uh, have higher blood flow rates than non-tunnel, where you could reach up to 400 ml per minute. And uh, the important thing is the tip of the tunnel catheter has to be in the right atrium. And it's usually wider in lumen. The off note, the actual blood flow rates in catheters are always lower than the prescribed pump flow rates, purely because of tubing dis uh, deformation due to elevated negative pressures in the catheters. Compared to AV fistulas, uh, they require an increase in treatment time of approximately 20% to achieve similar clearance. Hence, AV fistulas are very efficient in dialysis delivery in shorter duration of time. Preferred site of placement, the right internal jugular vein is the preferred site one can also use the left internal jugular vein, although when one gets left blood flows and there are chances of catheter malfunction. Uh, we usually avoid subclavians uh, because this can lead to high incidences of central vein stenosis. The tip position typically for non-tunnel catheters is in the superior vena cava and for the tunnel catheter, it is in the right atrium. For the femoral catheter, the tip is usually placed in the internal jugular vein. The shelf life or the use life for this catheter uh, varies by depending on the site of insertion, catheter type and catheter material. But typically the right internal jugulars are used anywhere from two to three weeks. The femoral catheter can be a single use or it can uh, range anywhere from uh, zero to seven days for patients who are bed bound and tunnel catheters can be used from six months and longer depending on the site and the center specific characteristics. Now coming to the important topic of complications related to catheters. 
So complications can be divided into immediate and late, and they may typically be because of catheters or related to the patient. Amongst the catheter-related complication, it can be due to mechanical causes or functional causes. Uh, mechanical causes typically because of uh, kinks, structural damage to the catheters, any position errors as in placement of the tip or uh, the curvature uh, that the catheter needs to attain, luminal thrombosis or presence of stenosis. And functional complications where Everybody, you know, tries to scratch their head saying, hmm, this looks good, but it's still not working and usually takes a long time to fix. Uh, the complication can be patient related. Uh, worst things happening, arrhythmias and cardiac arrest, especially when one uses guide wires or where the catheter touches the uh, hard surface. It can cause uh, pneumothorax and pneumothorax where introducer knees and roots actually uh, are not supposed to go where they do. Bleeding, hematomas, arterial punctures, air embolism, uh, presence of hemomediastinum, and injury to the phrenic or rectal and laryngeal nerve. Uh, rarely, and the worst case scenario, cardiac perforations have been seen in some patients. Best way to do it is to do it under ultrasound guidance, as one can see in this cartoon where the carotid is placed quite close to the right and left internal jugular and the vein kind of dances around the carotids. So makes sense in locating the vein appropriately using a uh, sonology guidance. Long-term complications, non-infectious, vessel stenosis is not uncommon in non-tunnel catheters. And this occurs because of vessel wall injury and stenosis uh, because of prolonged tunnel cuffed catheter use, especially if the catheter tip is in the superior vena cava or at the junction of the two veins. Uh, subclavian catheters are at exceedingly high risk and nephrologists usually frown when they see anything in the subclavians, then be it uh, hemodialysis catheters or pick lines or even sometimes ports. Catheter dysfunction is classified as early or late. Early catheter dysfunction may be related to uh, insertion technique where there is presence of sharp curves, the tip being in the superior vena cava, or the tip is stuck to the opposite venous wall leading to flow issues. And late causes may be dysfunction and is usually related to catheter thrombosis. Uh, the catheter, catheter thrombosis can be of two types. It can be extrinsic or intrinsic, meaning whether the problem is inside the catheter or it lies outside. Inside the catheter, typically one can have venous thrombosis, mural thrombosis, or arterial thrombosis, meaning the thrombus is present in the catheter. The catheter gets encased in a thrombus in the vein, or it has a big, large arterial thrombus hanging at one end of the catheter. Uh, ex uh, the intrinsic uh, uh, causes are intraluminal uh, catheter tip uh, and presence of fibrin sheath, which I will come to uh, very shortly. So extrinsic thrombus is presence of uh, the catheter in vein makes vein predisposed to thrombogenesis. And the incidence is anywhere from 2 to 63% in different studies. Back pressure changes can occur in the territory of the vein. And uh, this can be uh, required systematic, uh, systemical anticoagulation. Mural thrombosis are typically attached to the wall of the vessel. And similar thrombus in the atrium can be large and sometimes life-threatening when it gets dislodged from the catheter and uh, can cause uh, pulmonary embolism. Intraluminal thrombus develops after failure of uh, proper catheter flushing or if the blood remains in the catheter, there is presence of air bubble in the catheter, or if the heparin use uh, is inadequate. Catheter should be flushed with 5,000 units per ml of heparin up to the capacity of the catheter uh, and should not contain any air bubbles. They should be clamped immediately and the caps should be placed. 
uh, uh, presence of thrombus actually uh, forces us to use urokinase, cat flow, uh, and uh, thrombolysis, where you have to use around 5,000 units per ml of uh, urokinase to be flushed in both limbs up to the capacity and left there for around 30 minutes and then aspirated. If doesn't work, then again dwell for 30 more minutes. Uh, flush the catheter with similar volumes and then advance the solution by 0.2 ml saline every five minutes. So it's basically a push and pull. And uh, infusion of altoplase can be used uh, for one milligram per hour per lumen for two to four hours if the urokinase cat flow doesn't work. In case of TIF thrombosis, heparin may not be retained in the arterial ports where it leaks out and causes TIF thrombosis. It can be occlusive in nature or can be ball valve in type. Uh, usually it requires a forceful flushing. Although I have had cases where dislodging of the tip catheter has gone and uh, got stuck in the pulmonary artery, causing a lot of heartburn to the patient and to the nephrologist. So I would avoid this. And urokinase locks uh, may help where they, uh, you know, kind of uh, break down the uh, uh, clot itself. Now, fibrin sheath uh, starts at the point of entry of the catheter in the vein and may extend up to the tip, and it's loosely attached to the catheter. Off note, 100% catheters develop fibrin sheath, but most of them are not problematic. The start of the fibrin sheath can start anywhere at 48 hours. The sheath at the tip is usually disrupted by inflowing blood or saline, but sometimes it can fall. Uh, a ball valve or a flap like mechanism where the return is easy but the suction out of the catheter becomes difficult unfortunately because it's a mechanical problem urokinase uh, locking doesn't solve the problem people have used it over time at increased doses but doesn't work many times usually it requires catheter stripping that is uh, uh, you know kind of um, uh, introducing a snare from the femoral vein and then going and stripping the catheter of the uh, fibrin sheath. Uh, it may also entail changing the catheter over guide wire, which is probably the easiest thing to do. Um, sometimes one you know, takes the catheter out, does a angiographic balloon disruption of the fibrin sheath and then reintroduces the catheter over a guide wire. Uh, but there is no prophylactic regimen which may avoid this problem. Uh, this cartoon actually tells us one of the most important complications of catheter is catheter-related uh, bloodstream infections, which are all of us dread. On the left upper side, we can see that there is presence of a biofilm, which is required for uh, the presence of a CRBSI. And on this biofilm is where the bugs come in and uh, they start camping there, colonize, and finally become infective and may also metastasize from this area. Um, uh, the entry points for the CRBSIs are typically can uh, be uh, through the catheter, which is seen in the right lower cartoon. Uh, it can, uh, they can also traverse along the catheter wall uh, uh, as, as, as endogenous skin flora or because of uh, contaminated disinfectants, sometimes contaminated catheter hubs may be the uh, culprit uh, the reasons why people develop CRBSI. Um, I'm going to dwell a little bit on this slide and purely because this is probably the most important slide in this whole presentation. How do you uh, diagnose a CRBSIs and what is the appropriate therapy? So clinical features, uh, two out of three uh, should be present fever, which is more than 38 degrees centigrade before dialysis or uh, more than 37.7 degrees centigrade during dialysis. We all know uh, dialysis warms up the blood a bit. At the same time, patients have uh, clinical features of chills, rigors, presence of hypotension, or there is some alternative uh, unexplained malaise or uh, absent alternative side of infections, but patients are febrile. Uh, we, uh, the diagnosis of CRBSI is uh, made by microbiology, 
So at least one blood culture positive from a peripheral source, either the dialysis catheter or vein, and there's no other apparent source with the quantitative uh, presence of at least uh, 15 uh, colony forming units per catheter segment hub or tip or a quantitative of 10 raised to two colony forming units per catheter segment tip or hub, uh, presence of organism of the same species isolated from the catheter segment or a peripheral smear nearly you know, nails the diagnosis of CRBSI of uh, supportive uh, 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 availability would be, you know, quantification and showing that there is more than three to one ratio uh, of uh, the organism at the catheter tip to getting it in the peripheral blood. And also its persistence, uh, that is uh, two blood cultures uh, separated by two hours. All this, you know, kind of nearly nailed the diagnosis of CRBSI. There are three main types of catheter related infections, uh, typically exit infections, uh, tunnel infections, and uh, bloodstream infections, that is bacteremia or uh, uh, soft tissue infections because of metastasis from this. Now, prevention is better than cure. We all know this. So methods to prevent CRBSI, extra luminal strategies would be to take appropriate hub care, meaning you know, wash the hub with chlorhexidine, uh, exit site care, wash it with normal saline or tea bag or some antibiotic ointment, skin care, making sure that there's no uh, infected uh, lesions or folliculitis around the insertion site or exit site, connection, follow disconnection protocols in the dialysis unit, intraluminal strategies, uh, using antibiotic locks, antimicrobial locks, uh, using connectors. Uh, most important is a multidisciplinary team approach and the presence of a dedicated vascular access nurse or coordinator goes a long, long way in prevention of CRBSI. A very busy uh, slide. Actually, this is the holy grail of treatment of CRBSI. I basically want to draw everybody's attention to three stages. One is nailing the diagnosis, which we actually uh, discussed in the previous slide, getting positive blood cultures. Number two is the kind of organisms that one is dealing with, because some of them uh, may require uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, no salvage of catheter, taking it off, especially Staphylococcus aureus, fungal infections, and uh, pseudomonas, where one would actually be forced to remove the catheter itself, and then treat patients. Uh, management of CRBSI, uh, two strategies otherwise. One is removing the central venous catheter, and second is retaining the central venous catheter. Removing the central venous catheter can either be a venous catheter exchange over a guide wire uh, using the same exit site, or it could be removing the central venous catheter and reintroduction in a different site. Retaining the central venous catheter typically involves using either antibiotic locks in the catheter or systemic antibiotic uh, usage. Of note, removing the central venous catheters, a non-tunneled central venous catheter should always be removed in case of CRBSI. Uh, tunnel catheters uh, may be removed in the following situation. This is commonly the question that is in everybody's mind. So I want to dwell on this. One is blood cultures growing Staphylococcus aureus or Staphylococcus lugdunensis, presence of Klebsiella, mycobacteria, pseudomonas, or fungal infections, organisms like Candida. Uh, if there is any presence of complications like septic thrombosis, septic shock, endocarditis, or osteomyelitis, I cannot overemphasize that if one gets a patient who is hypotensive and you are suspecting CRBSI, salvaging the catheter does not work. One will not be able to salvage the patient. So underline hypotension, need of inotropes, don't think twice from the catheter. Uh, the, if there is presence of coexisting tunnel infection or abscesses, 
uh, positive persistent blood cultures uh, 72 hours after therapy telling you that either the it's a multi drug resistant organism or one uh, the one is simply overwhelmed with the infection of the catheter at the time of uh, central venous catheter removal uh, one should evaluate for the presence of fibrin sheath and fibrin sheath di di uh, disruption may be required there are four major approaches for treatment of CRBSI. One is definitive treatment of CRBSI generally requires systemic antibiotics along with uh, central venous catheter removal. However, it can lead to uh, venous stenosis and loss of precious excess site, bringing us to the other strategies. Systemic antibiotics alone uh, is uh, inadequate with a success rate of around 30% only. Uh, we do sometimes try this out and we get the result in the first 72 hours because if the patient is not improving, uh, doesn't make sense. You just have to remove the catheter. Immediate catheter removal plus catheter replacement using a guide wire to change the catheter has a success rate of around 80% in different studies. So this probably is a more a credible option and use of antibiotic or antiseptic locks along with the strategy alluded to earlier may increase the success rate by a five to ten percent and may uh, prevent we uh, go in terms of catheter salvage for some of our patients so to conclude a uh, catheter should be used as a bridge to av fistulas or a transplantation Fistula first initiative for patients with chronic kidney disease is the way to go ahead. Adequate and timely dialysis saves life. So referring nephrology services early can't be overemphasized. Uh, thank you all for a patient uh, listening. And I hand this over to Dr. Jigish Vyas to uh, conduct the uh, series again. Thank you once again. Thank you, Dr. Kunur, for your <clears throat> lucid talk. Uh, you pointed out the very pertinent uh, points. Uh, my question for you is uh, your uh, guidelines and your uh, way of management differs in pediatric patients, like if they come with uh, acute kidney injury, pediatric patients, uh, you do anything different from what you do for adults? That's a good question. So uh, broadly, the... Uh, Excess can be a difficult uh, situation for pediatric uh, services. Uh, most important is whether the material is available and the manpower is available to deal with them. Many of our rural hospitals or the semi-urban uh, hospitals may not be able to match up to this. We are a quaternary care center. So usually what we do is we treat them just the way we do with adults. But only thing is the material required is different the size of the catheters, we have them ready. So that goes a long way. Another uh, strategy is to use peritoneal dialysis in some of the pa pediatric patients, where uh, for them, probably a long-term access could be a pediatric PD catheter as compared to a hemodialysis catheter. One has to take into account that school uh, schools are important. One doesn't want to interfere with their quality of life. So, uh, you know, as a bridge to transplant, probably a PD may also be an equally uh, efficacious method to uh, deliver dialysis. Uh, 